As we began this fourth installment in our study of identifying the New Testament church, to those who are members of a church, believing in God, Christ is the Son of God and, sa and your Savior, believing that His way is the way of life, then we simply ask, can you explain to me why you're a member of whatever church it may be? I also ask those who are members of the church of Christ, can you explain to me really why you are? It may be that somebody would say, well, there's really nothing in a name. What difference does it make? Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment because that very question tells us much about what you believe about the importance of the church. Maybe you are a member of the church because that's the one your family was a part of as you grew up. It may be because of that's where your friends go or business associates. Maybe there's a lot of young people there. And maybe it's because they are entertained and all manner of social activities that really doesn't pertain to the knowledge of the Word of God and living like the Bible says is carried on like some country club or some type of thing of that nature, just a fraternal society in which people get together and enjoy one another's presence. It's not to rule out that the church of our Lord doesn't have social implications, not at all. We're dealing with society. We're to be the leavening of good in the world and the salt of the earth. But if it's strictly satisfying your earthly desires of companionship and fun and games, maybe that's the reason there are those people who are members of the churches that they're in. For many years, many believers in Christ have believed and taught that one church is as good as another. I grew up at a time as a young person where that was battled regularly as the truth of the New Testament was taught about the church that Jesus built. Of course, it is believed that one church is as good as another because, as I said earlier, of the false denominational concept of the church, one large invisible church made up of all of the different denominations. I've seen members of the Lord's church really get upset because you dealt with those particular matters and that false concept. Well, that, of course, told much on them because they don't really believe that those who believe in God and the Bible is the Word of God in Christ, but really don't think much about the church or think it has a thing to do with their salvation, makes any difference. So again, the idea that one church is as good as another is because of that false denominational concept of the church that I just explained. But let me ask you, is one hairdresser as good as another? Is one barber as good as another? Is one auto mechanic as good as another? And back when Brother Buddy was selling alignments, was one alignment machine as good as another Buddy? Now, he might be a bit ba biased when he was back selling, but the point is, that ought to get us to thinking, uh, do we believe a certain merchandise that one of is as good as another? So really to say that one church is as good as another says far more than your misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches about the oneness of the church. Doesn't it tell us that if we would all go back to the one Bible is the only rule of faith and practice that God gave us especially to instruct us in all matters of righteousness, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, and which he tells us to study, to write and divide the word of truth, to be enlightened, that we will not have to stand to shame before him in our ignorance, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Doesn't it tell us that if we have one God and there's one rule of faith and practice and there's one Savior, there's one way of salvation, and the Lord never, and there's nowhere it is found in the New Testament, said he would establish 
all kinds of churches, different names, different organizations, just way of being saved, different ways of worship. It's not there. The fact of the matter is, people just haven't really studied the Bible to learn what God thought about it. They haven't even tried to learn how to study the Bible. They're too busy with that which is going to burn up, that which will not go past this life. So I cannot but conclude in the study of the Bible that one church is not as good as another. And I do not speak of denominations. I speak of the church that Jesus built. We've already talked about that, Matthew 16, 18, and that you can see it coming into existence as you read Acts chapter 2. Now, if back in my young days people didn't read the Bible like they ought to, though more did than now, then what about today? How much time do you spend in an in-depth study of the Bible? Well, uh, we could all say, well, yeah, we could all do more. But do you study it? And do you read it? Do you think about it? Do you meditate on it day and night? Do you honestly look in your life at the light of it? Do you understand the place of the church in God's great scheme of redeeming man? Well, you won't unless you understand the Bible. Now, thus far in our studies, we've seen that the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament. By the way, the church that came into existence built by Christ something like 1,500 years before the first denominational church developed. We have seen that that church was founded by the scriptural builder, Christ. That it was founded upon the, script, the scriptural foundation that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God that it was founded in the scriptural place, Jerusalem, on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as I said earlier, recorded by Luke in Acts 2. And that Jesus founded only one single solitary church, his church. Now, why would anybody believe in God who loved us to give his son and the son who loved us and promised to build his church and shed his blood to purchase it, say that the church is really unimportant. Would they say that the blood shed by Jesus for the remission of sins is unimportant? Well, that's what it took to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. So in this study, we're going to notice another identifying mark of the church you read about in your New Testament. That is the scriptural name of the church. Now, it's widespread, long-standing and highly popular among the denominations to teach that there is nothing in a name. I mentioned that earlier, and I said we would come back to it. But this idea is not in keeping with the Scripture. It's not in keeping with reason based upon the Scripture. And the true matter is those who use it don't really believe it themselves. Let me show you how. If you were to call any denominational church by a derogatory name, they wouldn't like it. But if there's nothing in the name, why do they care? Are they synagogues of Satan? I don't get upset. There's nothing in the name. They're not going to say, we don't care what you call us because there's nothing in the name. The name would be the, the same would be the case if you called any member of those churches. A derogatory name. You're a child of Satan. By the way, Jesus did that kind of thing to some of those religious people of his day and his own brethren, the Jews. They would say there's something in the name. If there's nothing in the name, why not call your daughter Jezebel? Now, with the ignorance of the Bible around, uh, you may find some today calling their daughter Jezebel. But for biblically enlightened people, they wouldn't call their daughter Jezebel because there's something in the name. I don't think they'd call her Rover. Indeed, there is much in a name. There's so much in a name that God... Named the first couple, Adam and Eve, Genesis 5-2. Now, we haven't got time to go back and study all about why he did that, but if you're really interested, you can. If there's nothing in the name, explain why God changed Abram's name to Abraham, Genesis 17-5. If there's nothing in the name, why did Paul condemn divisions 
based upon divisive names and mentions it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. At the very beginning of that rather lengthy letter, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. I asked Paul from this statement alone, do you think there's something in the name? His argument doesn't make sense if there's nothing in the name. And since the Holy Spirit guided him to write those words, gave him those words, then the Holy Spirit's words don't make any sense if there's nothing in a name. Well, how does the New Testament refer to the church that Jesus built? The church to which he adds all those who believe in him, based upon the word of God, Romans 10, 17, repent of their sins, Acts 17, 30, Acts 2, 38, confess their faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, and complete their obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. How does the New Testament refer to the church, that church, that one you read about on the pages of your own New Testament? In Matthew 16, 18, we referred to already, but he called it my church. Now, whose church is it? If you say, that's my car, what am I to understand by those words that came from your mind to tell me about that car? Well, I know it's yours. It belongs to you. Acts 8, 1 calls the body of Christ the church, meaning a group of called out people, called out by the gospel. Remember, it's to be preached to every creature, for that's the way God calls people out of sin, Mark 16, 15 and 16. So I understand then that the Lord has that group and he has but one such group of people it's referred to the realm of the saved by the term church of god the holy spirit had paul use that in addressing the church at corinth in first corinthians chapter one and verse two again that shows ownership who owns the church Our god does and we're all familiar or at least most of us when Paul closed out with the words Paul closed the book of Romans with, part of them, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Because the church, that one church Jesus promised to build and did so, Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2, is organized on a congregational level in various geographic locations, then each congregation would be a church of Christ. So the churches of Christ salute you. And why not just use a term that describes perfectly the relationship of those Christ saved to the Savior, the head of the church to the church, and so on. So Paul is speaking here in Romans 16, 16 to various congregations in various geographic locations. And what does he say? Well, these designations, or this designates in particular, that they belong to Christ. Why can't we just be satisfied with the thus saith the Lord when it comes to anything pertaining to Christianity and especially the church and now the name of the church? In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12, the inspired apostle Paul referred to that same church as the body of Christ. It's the body of people that belongs to the Lord. They don't belong to themselves. They are new creatures in Christ. They are what they are religiously by the will of Christ and their submission to it. Then we see the church of the living God where Paul is talking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15 and he talks about the household of God and defines it to be the church of the living God. The family of God is the church of the living God. In the Hebrews epistle, Hebrews 12 and verse 23, he talks about the church of the firstborn meaning simply the church made up of the firstborn in the sense they're new in Christ. They've undergone the spiritual birth in being baptized into Christ. The Lord has added them to the church. Now what about other religious groups? 
Well, it's strange that people who claim to belong to Jesus Christ will be a member of a religious group whose name is foreign to God's Word. Why is that the case? Well, there may be many reasons. One of them is they don't understand the authoritative will of heaven in the words of the Bible and especially the New Testament. Jesus plainly said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last name. Now, when you study about the name of the church, what do you find? We sometimes talking about the book of life and those names that are entered therein being those who will go to heaven. Well, let me ask as you read the word of God, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. Is the church of which you are a member, does it compare and harmonize with what you read about in your Bible? Again, I pause to say, but when do you read your Bible? Do you pay any attention to it? Do you strive to rightly divide or handle or write the word of truth in the study of it? Because remember, 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said that to a young preacher. He couldn't preach what he did not know. And so that's part of the New Testament of Christ. It's given to guide and lead us. And now we're specifying and zeroing in on what it says about the name that the Holy Spirit gave to the inspired writers to refer to the realm of those Christ saved. Now, if you are part of a church because you think Christ saved you, then does it measure up to what the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament of the Bible, say about it? And if you're going to refer to the church, why do you refer to it in terms foreign to the will of Christ? Well, how does the New Testament refer to not only the church collective, but to members of the Lord's church? Now, in moving to this point, let me remind you there is no proper name for the church collective. What you will read will be descriptive terms. And it takes all those descriptive terms used by the Holy Spirit about the church to give you some in-depth understanding of the church. But look at the individual members of that church. Those people who were baptized when the church was established, Acts 2, 38 and verse 41, were added by the Lord himself to that church. They were born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 3 and 5, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38. And the Lord added those people forgiven of their sins to the church he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18. Well, you've got to remember there was no, well, I've been saved by Christ. Let me select the church that best suits me, the church of my choice, and be a part of it and refer to it in any way I want to. But the problem right there is, as it suits me. That's been always the problem. I would suggest to you problems in the Lord's church, just read the book of Acts, have been caused more by people seeking to have their own way about something than at least going on a par with those who teach an absolute false doctrine. Everything the Bible teaches, and specifically in the Lord's life, talks about yielding your will to the will of Christ. And thus will be judged, as I quoted a while ago, by the words of Christ. Now, where do you find those words of Christ? John 12, 48. If not the New Testament. Well, when it comes to the individual members of the church, there are some descriptive terms there, too. Disciples, Acts 20 and 7. This, of course, has reference to those who learn of Christ, who are students of Christ, who are followers of Christ. We find another one in the word saints, and the Roman Catholic Church has ruined that word. If you listen to them, you have to be dead maybe thousands of years or hundreds of years or whatever. Certain things you must meet, and then you're appointed a saint long after you're dead. But that's not the Bible's teaching. The word saints is a descriptive term, and we're called that because we are saved from our past sins, that we're dedicated now to the Lord as a new creature where? In Christ, where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3, forgiveness of sins being one of them, sonship being one of them, heir of God being one of them. We're set apart by the gospel as we believe and obey it. We studied about that last week. 
We're also seeing that individual members are referred to as the beloved of God, Romans 1, 7. Well, you would think that would be the case in view of the fact that the church is God's family. They're called brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And that simply shows the relationship we have as brothers and sisters in God's family, which, of course, would be in Christ. We're called sons of God. The relationship, then, that we have with the Father, Romans 8, 14. Same thing's true when you talk about children of God, 1 John 3, 1. Again, our relationship with the Father. That means it ought to tell us that he views us the same way. If we view him as our spiritual father, he views us as his spiritual children. What about heirs of God? Romans eight seventeen. Well, we, that just simply means we inherit from God. Whatever we have as faithful sons of God, members of the Lord's family, the church, we get from God. It says... It is in truth the will of God says we inherit. And it would do well sometimes to strengthen us to read the New Testament as to what there is for us that we inherit. And only for his family that are faithful to him. There is then also the term priest, 1 Peter 2 verse 9. All these descriptive terms down through this one shows, this one shows, that we may offer acceptable worship to God. Now under the Old Testament, the law of Moses you had the Levitical priesthood, and all the people had to offer all that they offered in worship through a priest. But the New Testament teaches us that each one who is a member of the church offers through our high priest, the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, all our praise and all our prayers and all our service to God. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you'll see then that our bodies are to be offered as living sacrifices which is our reasonable service to God. We're under his control through our will to submit to his will. That's what it was all about when we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot serve God with reservations. Well, I'll go so far, but I'll retain this to be used as I see fit and as I like. You can't do it. And we studied about that last week on Sunday afternoon when we were noticing that we're new creatures in Christ. But then there's one name that stands out above all, and it's not a descriptive term. It is a proper name, just like your surname. In Acts 11:26, the disciples, those learners, those members of the church, those saints, beloved of God, brethren, sons of God, children of God, heirs of God, priests, were called Christians first at Antioch. It means one who is of Christ. This is a proper name, again, I say, expressing our relationship to Christ. So each member of the church, each saint, has a proper name. We're Christians. We are Christians only, and we are the only Christians because we're members of Christ's only church. Denominationalism doesn't adhere to any of this, and that's how fouled up they are when it comes to to understanding what the New Testament teaches about the church. Now, I don't know of anybody that claims belief in Christ as Savior that would fight disciples, saints, beloved of God, brethren, sons of God, children of God, heirs of God, priests, or the term Christians. I've never heard anybody claiming Christ as Savior oppose those terms. Every one of them are scriptural. But what they try to justify are terms that are not found in the New Testament, and it all comes back to this false denominational concept of the church, that the church has nothing to do with your salvation. Well, then why did Christ shed his blood to purchase it? Is it not worth the blood of Christ to denigrate the church of our Lord that he promised to build and built, Acts chapter 2, is to denigrate and slander the very plan of God in his son dying and shedding his blood to purchase the church because the church is worth the purchase price. I'd like to see somebody stand up and say, well, the church has nothing to do with our salvation. Well, did the blood of Christ have anything to do with our salvation? It was shed for the remission of sins. And in the Lord's Supper, we commemorate that. We show forth his death till he come again. Did his death have nothing to do with our salvation? Did his suffering have nothing to do with our salvation? 
And yet Acts 20 and 28 says he purchased the church with his blood. No wonder he adds all those who are obedient to the gospel, God's power to save, to the church. Acts 2, 38, 41, 42, and 47. So why will we do that? Why we give lip service to Christ, the only Savior, and not give lip service to the church he promised to build and purchase with his own blood? It doesn't make sense. Now, none of what I've said thus far nor will it be so through the rest of the sermon, is difficult for any normal person to understand. But if you don't study your Bible, if you're not convinced it's the final rule, infallible rule, inspired rule of faith and practice, then I can see why you say, well, that's just what they believe. Well, where does your faith come from? Does it come from the Word of God? Does your confidence in God and Christ and salvation come from what the Bible teaches? Or is it just your feelings? There's all sorts of things can give you good feelings. None of them having to do with what the Bible teaches. We must wear only the names the Bible uses to designate God's people. I'm not a Baptist because the Bible never refers to God's people as such, and there's other reasons too. I'm not a Methodist for that reason, a Presbyterian. I'm not any of those things, Episcopalian or Lutheran. And we get a whole host to us. Somebody said, what about the community churches? I don't even know that we in the church understand the concept of community churches. Years ago, and there have always been community churches, but they would usually be out in an area where there was no denominational church, no particular one. So they would build a building, and I've seen it traveling, all, especially through my younger years, Here's a building set here that says community church. Well, what goes on in those churches? Where did they come from? What they do is simply adhere to what's characteristic of all denominational churches. Why would they do that? Because they don't understand the Lord's church as presented in the New Testament. Because they don't accept it as needful to anybody's salvation. Christ saves you. You have accepted him in as your personal Savior. And then you pick that church that suits you best. Well, the community church is a hodgepodge of all of that. If you go to any of these community churches around here, you'll find that the fellow that started them, and that's where they start from an individual, sometimes a family, owns the whole caboodle, controls the whole thing, and does as he pleases. Well, what are they doing there that separates them from Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecost, whatever? Nothing. They do about anything. What is the guideline? Believe in one God. Believe the Bible is the word of God. Believe that you've sinned, whatever that may be. It separated you from God. You need being saved from it, though they don't know much more than that. And that you have taken Christ as your personal Savior. The rest of it is going to be a hodgepodge of what you see in any denominational church and then so. I'm not denigrating them from the standpoint of being personally against them. I'm simply saying, you don't hear this taught today. You don't even hear it taught in the Lord's church like it ought to. Thus, you have members of the church who are sliding away, and they've been doing it for years. And thus, you have, quote, quote, liberal churches, those who teach doctrines that loose us from what God and his word binds on us. And they do about anything. Well, how do they do that? Well, if you give up the word of God, you still want to believe in God. Christ of the Bible is the word of God. But you don't write and divide the word truth. You don't believe in the authority of the scriptures. The Bible's not the only rule of faith and practice. Guess what you're going to become? Another denomination among the denominations. Now that's what we really need in this country. Another denomination. But you can be a Christian. And a Christian only. So I'm a member of the church of Christ. As that term is defined and used in the scriptures. Romans 16, 16. Because it's on descriptive term, the only descriptive term among all these that really shows directly the relationship of those Christ saved to the Savior. Now, does that rule out these other scriptural terms, Church of God? No, it doesn't. But see, if you choose Church of God, there's a denomination called Church of God, and you've got to explain all that. Well, denominations do not want to be called Church of Christ. If you, if you don't believe that, go out there and say, why don't you put up on your marquee, this is not the Church of Christ? And see how far you get. Oh, there is something in the name, then you find out. 
Now, just having Church of Christ above the front door doesn't say that you are what you're claiming to be. That's why we're studying the identifying more than one marks of the Lord's Church. It just happened to be now on the name the Bible uses for the church Jesus built and the individual names of members. You do not find in the Bible Baptist Christians. We used to preach that. If you go back and look, you'll see no telling how many debates we had when it came down to people who still read their Bible but they followed denominational doctrines because they believed their denominational doctrine was taught in the Bible as it was presented in their peculiar discipline a prayer book or catechism and they thought they had to be right now who cares about much of anything including many members of the church so what many members of the church assembled in other places this morning if they were hearing this sermon would be highly offended why because they've fallen into the denominational mindset. They still believe those people, well, they, they can be acceptable to God. Who's to say they're not? Well, but they haven't even been baptized the, by the authority of Christ for the rest of sin. Well, you know, look how pious they are. Can you say, oh, so-and-so who does this, 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 uh, or so on? It, God won't accept him. You see, that's the denominational mindset. It doesn't judge all things in the light of truth. Well, you shouldn't judge anyway. Well, I'm afraid they're judging us. People who say don't judge are in the process of judging. Some people who say you shouldn't judge anybody. They're some of the most judgmental people on this earth. God made us to take in evidence, reason with it, draw a conclusion, and make a decision. That's a judgment, you know. And any time we plead with people to obey the gospel, we're asking them to judge themselves in the light of divine truth and determine whether they're saved or lost. And if they're lost, to do what's necessary to be saved. Listen to this from Charles Spurgeon. There has been a much greater Baptist preacher. In fact, I don't know the Baptists have him nowadays. He said it's close to the Bible. This is from Spurgeon Memorial Library, Volume 1, page 168. He was, um, in fact, the church building he preached in so long is still in London. You can go by and see it. He wrote some very good material. He wrote this in that book. I say of the Baptist name, let it perish, but let Christ's name last forever. I look forward with pleasure to the day when there will not be a Baptist living. I hope the Baptist name will soon perish, but let Christ's name endure forever. Now you remember Bob Ross and I debated. In fact, he had a debate here on instrumental music. He pushed Sermon, uh, uh, Spurgeon's books. Pushed them all over the place. I don't know whether the man's still alive now or not, but that's what he did. But that's what Spurgeon said. And he would not allow mechanical instrument of music in the worship in that church building while he lived. Well, listen to the great reformer Martin Luther. Here's what he said in the life of Luther. It's recorded there by Stork, page 289. I pray you to leave my name alone and call not yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. Who is Luther? I have not been crucified for anyone. Let us call ourselves only Christians after him from whom our doctrine comes. Well, after he died, then the people who followed them decided they would designate themselves as followers of Luther, so they became Lutherans, and there's the Lutheran church. Well, what about religious titles? Well, in the long ago, the Jews corrupted their speech by using half the speech of Ashdod, Nehemiah 13, 23 through 24. You remember Ezra and Nehemiah came back and they brought a remnant with them and from the Babylonian captivity, and they were restoring Judaism in Israel. And they found the people there uh, using terms and so forth that were contrary to what Jews did living close to the law. Figuratively speaking, we have much of the language of Ashdod in the religious world today and even in the church. There are many exalting titles that are used in opposition to the teaching of the Bible. Everything you will find that Christ taught and the apostles taught regarding the disposition of mind each member of the church had one toward another was not to exalt anybody above what, that, what the other one is. Now, there are different roles in the church, different things. Yes, there are. But they're not to be put down and somebody else held up on a pedestal to be better than me. So there were those titles that were forbidden. And one of those which we're very familiar with is reverend. Reverend has been used so much, I don't know how reverend the word reverend is anymore. It's so common. But let us note the English word reverend. It's found only once in our Bibles. Psalm 111, verse 9. There was a time when members of the church knew that one because they dealt with their denominational friends and 
the preachers. Here's what it says about God. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. I don't think I want to be called by that name applied to God. That's meant to describe him who's far above all things. And no one's any higher than he. So the only time it's used is in reference to God. Is it interesting that there's no mention in the scriptures of Reverend Paul or right Reverend James or the right Reverend Father Pope Peter? None of that's there. See how simple New Testament Christianity is if we will be content to order all things from a studied Bible as the Bible teaches. Many preachers speak of Paul as just plain Paul, Peter, the same, plain Peter, and John is just plain John. But when it comes to their titles, then they exalt themselves to all kinds of degrees. I preached one time on a Sunday afternoon after I'd preached a baccalaureate sermon. And a Baptist uh, came to me, a black Baptist church, and asked me to preach to them. And I told them up front, I said, you're going to hear things that you won't agree with as far as Baptist doctrine. But I'll be glad to come down and preach to you on Sunday afternoon. And it was a Sunday afternoon. To make a long story short, we met in a little room before we started, and here's what was said to me. Now, how do you want to be introduced? I said, well, just announce me as uh, the preacher for the Hampton Church of Christ. Well, now, we can call you reverend, doctor, pastor, whatever. Just tell us how you want to be uh, announced and introduced. I said, no, no, just David Brown, preacher for the Hampton Church of Christ. They, they didn't quite get all of that. But after two and a half hours later, if they listened, they understood something about the restoration of primitive, pure New Testament Christianity. So... Why do they call plain Paul and plain Peter, but they refer to themselves as right reverend so-and-so? It would be comical if it wasn't so terribly tragic what people do to exalt themselves. And brethren, it comes back to this. 99% of our problems in the Lord's church and out of the religious world that claims Christ as Savior is each one of us wants to be exalted and have our own way or we'll bust it to pieces. As one person who should have never served as an elder years ago when he was asked to resign because of his actions, he said, I ought to come down there and tear that place all to pieces. Well, the brethren knew then for sure that they had decided right when they said, you don't need to be an elder. Such an attitude. Many today wrongfully use the word pastor to refer to the preacher of a local congregation. They don't know any better because it's denominational. And they don't think for themselves. They don't study the Bible for sure. The Bible says that a pastor is an elder of the church, a presbyter, 1 Timothy 3 and Acts 14, 23, Titus 1. The pastor and preacher are not necessarily the same. In other words, pastor is not used exclusively to apply to the evangelist, but denominations do. Yet look at Ephesians 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. If they're one and the same, why did he say in some pastors and leave the evangelists alone? Because that's what he meant. But he didn't, did he? And a close study in right and defining the word of truth tells us that the word pastor, unless the preacher is serving as an elder, the word pastor applies exclusively to the elder. The word father is another word often used as religious title in direct opposition to the teaching of Christ. You'll remember in our debate with uh, the Catholic that would refer to him as father. I did call him doctor because he had earned doctor's degree. And uh, that I have no problem with. The problem is I don't like to be called by those titles because the denominational world doesn't understand that it may be an academic degree. They just know why they call their pastors. They just call them doctor, right, reverend, whatever. We avoid these high-sounding titles that magnifies one person above everybody else. Now, the whole idea in denominationalism is clergy laity. And clergy idea that developing out of the Roman Catholic Church means that you are one that's above everybody else, and then there's the laity. Now, if you apply laity when it comes to, say, medicine, that means you're not a trained doctor. Well, I can understand that. But it's not so in the Lord's Church, where we're all on equal plane. We all approach God through Jesus Christ. We all serve Him by the same Bible the New Testament in particular. And thus we worship the same God on the same thing. We have different roles the Bible assigns, but none of them exalts anybody above anybody else as better than they and on a higher plane. 
If you go to Roman Catholicism and if you go to the Church of England, those who are above the vicar in the Church of England or the parish priest in the Roman Catholic Church are known as princes of the church. Now, that really sounds like they're going to get down and wash feet, doesn't it? And if you go over there and look at those big uh, cathedrals and so forth, they'll have a part of it that is exalted for the prince of the church who's there. Well, isn't it strange that millions will use a title that is positively forbidden by our Lord when he said, Call no man your father? Well, it can't be that he meant an actual daddy in a family because he instructs fathers of families in how they're to conduct themselves. It's a religious title, and we want to get away from that kind of stuff. The Church of Christ is scriptural in name and language when it is faithful to the New Testament. The Church of Christ calls Bible things by Bible names. As Paul told Titus, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Or rather to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.13. Elihu stated wisdom when in Job 32, 21 through 22, he said, Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. Thus we've studied from the New Testament, from the New Testament of Jesus Christ, another scriptural reason one ought to be a member of the Church of Christ as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, and that is because it is scriptural in name. As we close this lesson, we'll continue more with these studies, Lord willing, and later lessons on identifying the church that Jesus built. And you need to ask yourself the question, am I part of that church? And if I am, am I faithful to my Lord according to his authority in that church, serving him day by day as he directs? If you're not a Christian, we studied in this sermon the simple plan of salvation. It really requires a lot in the heart to do it, but it's simply stated, as you know. As a child of God, are you living like God expects you to live and teaches in the New Testament in that church of Christ? You need to repent of your sins if you're not. Come confessing them, and we'll pray with you and for you. If you're subject then to the good invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.